Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about is what is, what can we, how can we interpret MBS? So what can we get from MBS and what can't we get from MBS? So one thing we always have to remember is that a modified barium swallow study is one where there are, um, it's difficult to understand depth perception. So for instance, in a lateral view, you can't really tell which is the left or the right side. That can make it difficult for looking at things like residue, where you have bilateral structures such as the vollecula, the piriform sinuses, where sometimes if patients have residue in, on one side, it can appear as if it's on both sides in the lateral view. So that's something to keep in mind. Right, and the way to get around that is to do an AP view, right, a frontal view, where you can see laterality better. Yeah, and I think it's always interesting that the anatomical differences can vary so much between patients that even depth of the vollecula or the piriform sinuses can sometimes make it appear as if somebody has a lot of residue when it's really just their structure. Right. Um, and I do think that pairing it with the AP view can really help get a sense of that, but like you said, the 3D interpretation of what's happening in the swallow can be really difficult with MBS. Right. So let's begin by, it, or can you think of anything else uh, that's an important consideration besides depth perception? Um, obviously with modified barium swallow studies, sensation is not easy to test. It's really a study of movement of the bolus. So we can talk about kinematics of the bolus, we can talk about kinematics of structures, but the kinematics of those structures like the hyoid bone and larynx are a representation of the muscles that we cannot measure, right? So all of those things need to be inferred. So I really view a modified barium study as a way to um, get some objective information about movement, but n we never find out the underlying forces of movement. So for instance, if the hyoid bone elevates, we're assuming that the submentals were involved, but we can't actually measure the submental muscles, but we do need to infer their association with that movement. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. And that's even speaking on muscle groups, um, and it goes even further that, of course, we can't comment on individual muscles themselves. Um, I've seen reports before where muscles are mentioned, but I think it's it's irrelevant. What really matters is is the movement of the structures and how they're impacting physiology and how that physiology impacts the bolus itself. Um, so I do think that that's something important to keep in mind. So do you think they're irrelevant because somebody said, uh, did they say suggest? Because I certainly have seen certain movements, um, like for instance, if the larynx is not moving at all and the hyoid is moving, then I'll say, uh, I'll indicate that the hyoid moved, the larynx did not move, um, suggesting that the involvement of the longitudinal pharyngeal muscles and viral hyoid or something like that. Oh, I think that's absolutely appropriate. And I think that's the line of thinking that we should have when looking at MBS, I think knowing the muscles that move the structures is really important. Where we have to be care careful is saying things like, if you don't see anterior movement of the hyoid bone, infer or making statements that the mylohyoid is weak. Oh, okay. So it's okay to say these muscles are likely involved, but to try to say what is going on with them, Absolutely. like they're uh, atrophied or something like that, it, it's not something that fluoro can tell you, right? right. We don't know uh, whether or not they're weak. We don't know if they're not weak. We just know that they, they're likely involved, but it could be the muscle is fine. It's the cranial nerve that's the issue. Right. It could be si the signal from the brainstem that's the issue. The point is, without um, the fluoro, it can only allow us to infer the structures that might relate to the movements that we do or do not see. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's take a chance at looking at some fluoros and seeing if perhaps we can get a sense of um, whether or not video fluoroscopy um, <clears throat> can tell us some of these things if we're looking at them together. And um, let's just look at this in real time. This is a patient who's had a stroke. You've never seen this before, I've this not, patient? I've not seen this before. Okay, me neither. Oh, good one. It's 
person is really struggling with this bolus, right? Oh, yeah. All right, so the first thing I like to do is I like to think of among the swallowing events that we might consider, I try to start broad and then get mm -hmm. more specific. So if the swallowing events that we could consider include things like lingual function, swallow trigger, laryngeal vestibule closure, pharyngeal constriction, and um, upper esophageal sphincter function, which, if there's one or if there are many, are involved in the particular swallow. So um, did anything jump out? So if I, let's play like we're the person who can't record fluoro. Yeah. <laughs> okay, which means that we just saw this one time, now we have to make an assessment. If you had to make an assessment at this point, which of those events, if any, would you say are definitely problematic? Wow, that's really tough. It really, really makes you realize how looking at a swallow one time is just not sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you why is because when I see a swallow the very first time, my eye goes to where there's a lot of residue. It, it, it's, it picks up what's flashy, and that may not be what is most impaired. Right. So for example, the first thing that I noticed was limited upper esophageal sphincter opening, mm -hmm. resulting in quite a bit of residue in mm -hmm. The piriform sinuses. I'm looking at this swallow globally as this person definitely has a swallow efficiency issue. Sure. Um, it's in the second and third time that I watch it that I'm really trying to understand how the structures are connected to really un get at what's what is the major problem here. And sometimes it can be the tongue, mm -hmm. and that wasn't really where my eye was fixated at first because we're clinicians. We're looking at where's the bolus going, what's happening. Um, but I would say as a global interpretation, that's where my eyes were fixated first. So you make a good point. We should first consider broader categories, which is, is this an airway protection issue? Mm -hmm. Is this a bolus efficiency issue? Or is this both? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that in this swallow, uh, there was both because mm -hmm. we could see that there were moments where this person was penetrating and sort of pushing it back out in addition to obviously there's quite a bit of residue. And then we can move forward to the idea of let's look through all of these swallowing events and see which is contributing to either airway protection mm -hmm. or bolus efficiency or both. And um, so if we're gonna hit play again, one thing I notice is that the tongue is doing what I see a lot of healthy people do, which is when you have something mm -hmm. super thick there's a phenomenon that the research has documented called molecular aggregation. And that's when there's something pretty thick, what you usually want to do is not swallow what the bolus way up here because we know that it's probably going to, a, a, a thicky, a thicky, <laughs> a, a thick, sticky substance um, will likely get caught here. What most people do is they sort of pull it down to aggregate here, then swallow with most force from the base of the tongue. So that's not too uncommon. I think the difference here is that then this person does allow the bolus to move quite a bit farther down. Mm -hmm. um, again, I've seen that in healthy people and so far so good. Ah, hmm. but there we had the swallow. If we move back a little bit, then at the time of the swallow, some of that bolus has then entered the airway here. Mm -hmm. And that is because it was just around before the swallow started the bolus, the laryngeal vestibule closure mechanism hadn't had a chance to close. Although the epiglottis does look as though it's beginning to invert. But by the time it does, the bolus is already in the airway. And we can see epiglottis, epiglottic inversion down to this level. So it does look like this person did achieve some epiglottic inversion. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? I would agree with that. But at this point, the bolus was already in the airway, Yep. right? And this is a thick bolus, so it's not necessarily moving that fast, but there's just so much of it adjacent to the airway at the start of the swallow. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with that. I think that considering where the bolus position is in the pharynx when the swallow is initiated is an important factor. It's not necessarily that you blame the bolus, but keeping in mind where that position is is important because once the swallow started, the bolus was right there. Right. And it could be that, as we've seen in healthy people, that that 
pattern of behavior to start to swallow with the bolus in the piriforms. We know it's been well documented in research that that happens in healthy adult, adults, especially older adults. Maybe that was this person's baseline behavior before the stroke. Mm -hmm. But now in the now that the stroke has happened, it now puts this person at a greater risk. So um, let's continue. So one thing I'm not seeing is a whole lot of pharyngeal constriction, which would be based on the stripping wave that we would see in this region here. Yep. So that's probably helping to um, keep the bolus in the pharynx, as well as, as you mentioned before, upper esophageal sphincter opening. It seems to be short in duration. Mm -hmm. So needing multiple swallows gives the bolus a chance to sort of penetrate the airway there. Interestingly enough, likely because this was a thick bolus, the person did not end up aspirating and seemed to have pretty good ability to eject the bolus. Each of these times that you can see it enters, they seem to swallow it out. Mm -hmm. There it goes in. It's kind of weird the way the bolus is getting it in there. Really like, it looks is. like a finger kind of digging into the airway, like wiggly. Interesting. So this seems to be somebody who's got both airway protection and bolus sufficiency issues. We can check both of those boxes. Mm -hmm. They also have issues with um, laryngeal vestibule closure. Well, actually, the laryngeal vestibule closure was fine. Um, it was really having to do with, what, was it swallow onset? relative to bolus position. Let's play that again. What do you think? Yeah, so... You can frame by frame. Right yeah. <laughs> the thing that I really noticed is watch the UES here. Mm -hmm. It almost appears like there's some sort of bar or a stricture mm -hmm. here that's mm -hmm. really limiting. Yes, yes, yes. The amount of so opening and look right it's already here. closed yep. so look how much bolus is left behind it's really pinched off a substantial amount right so, so you can see the bolus sort of go around it yeah and then close yep it's right there so you when you look at the upper esophageal sphincter you really want to see a nice wide even mm -hmm. column True. to allow the bolus to move through the upper esophageal sphincter so what's difficult is when it get when it becomes pinched off so mm -hmm, early. Mm -hmm. Now look at all of that bolus that's left behind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what you notice is is when the airway invasion occurs, which you can see it coming from the piriforms, either over the arytenoids or between. It's hard to tell in the lateral view. But the bolus wants to go towards the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if that airway is open, that's, that's where it wants to go. So it looks like what we're saying is this follicular aggregation that we see here, again, we see that quite a bit in healthy people. Mm -hmm. But in healthy people, when they do swallow, that swallow would have cleared everything. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, a combination of perhaps pharyngeal constriction mm -hmm. and UES opening meant that much of this bolus was left hanging around. And so now this person is left in between swallows with um, a more uh, risky situation because in between swallows, you're not protecting your airway, your airway is open to breathe. And as a result, multiple swallows, none of which are particularly efficient, end up putting the person's airway at risk because mm -hmm. as you said, the bolus is going to follow the path of least resistance. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing happening yeah. here. It's really it's really important to look at the big picture. I, I think that sometimes laryngeal closure gets um, inappropriately blamed mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. airway invasion mm -hmm. because of something else that's happening. That's right. But look, you can see when the bolus starts to enter the laryngeal vestibule, there's multiple swallows that are occurring to try to eject that bolus out. But the bolus is like, I'm here. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I right, can't right. get into the esophagus. As we say, never blame the bolus. Exactly. That's right. So. Okay, well, let's look at oh. another one. That So that one was one that was quite interesting. You, your first, A lot of people might say, oh, this was a delay. There was poor lingual movement. But it really maybe ended up to be farther down related to pharyngeal and UES issues. Yeah. What would you do next in that swallow? What I would probably do next in that swallow... Let's see, open it back up. 
What I love about this is that we're probably going to have two very different answers, mm -hmm. and neither one of us may be right or wrong. Or, or wrong. That's right. Well, obviously, um, if this person, if this was the first swallow, and this person didn't seem to have a risky uh, Thin liquid situation, I'd probably have them do a liquid wash just to clear things out first. Not mm -hmm. necessarily to be the bolus to test physiology, just to get a clearer view of what's going on. Um, I would probably go um, with a thinner bolus at this point because I would want to know whether or not the amount of UES opening that is possible mm -hmm. allows for more passage and less mm -hmm. residue afterward. And in that bolus, I would encourage the person to look at the floro and try to hold the bolus in their oral, oral cavity until I say go with the intent to get everything down in mm -hmm. one swallow. So I'd go with a thinner bolus, a smaller bolus, biofeedback, and a command to try to get it down in all, all in one gulp, gulp because they, they do have complete laryngeal vesicle closure. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Yeah, I think I want to say first that this swallow really speaks to me in why I rarely if ever start with pudding in my first swallow <laughs> yeah. because the residue can really um, kind of muddy up the water mm -hmm. so to speak um, I like to see thin liquid first when I have a nice clear pharynx and then graduate um, to thicker consistencies mm -hmm. I agree with what you said about going to thin to really try to wash it out what I might do is quickly turn the patient AP briefly mm -hmm. just to mm -hmm. look and see if it's symmetrical residue um, if you turn AP and you see that the residue is really present on one side that might um, that might cue me in a later swallow in a lateral view to maybe try a head turn true but I try not to move too fast to postural positioning and changes until I see what's natural. Yeah. So I would do a thin liquid in a natural position, even if I knew it was asymmetrical. Based on that information, I might try a head turn um, to try to uh, clear that residue. Right. And you know, I AP is one of those things where I love it and I hate it. Because mm -hmm. depending on the logistics of the room and the patient's yeah. tolerance, it can be annoying. But you're right, it is definitely important to assess mm -hmm. at this point uh, when there's all this residue sitting here. Yeah. But the one thing I would most definitely ask the patient is if they felt it in their throat. Yeah. I'd want to get a sense of what their um, sensory perception is of what's happening with their swallow. And that's a perfect swallow to get a sense of, do you feel what's in your throat? Yeah. <laughs> so it seems like a nice follow-up to this could be, at this point, we're at the end of the swallow. Let's say we've seen them get to this point, and then there's all that stuff in there. And um, we ask them, hey, is there anything left sitting around? And let's say they say no. Then it would be kind of cool to turn the floro on and say, so this black stuff is what's left in your throat after, mm -hmm. right at this moment. Um, and we might consider saying, now we want to know if it's mostly on one side or the other side, turn them AP, make a decision, and then follow up with some liquid washes and perhaps another bolus to test. Yep. Cool. What do you think of that? Mm. Let's play that again. It's pretty functional to me. <laughs> so, bolus efficiency, airway protection. Now, obviously, this person um, has a functional swallow, mm -hmm. right? But on the scale of functional, there are things that it's not the most pristine normal swallow you've ever seen, mm -hmm. right? But there are things that are uh, perhaps um, more on the functional but not normal side that you could still point out, although you might mm -hmm. not treat, just as a note. Because here's the thing, we have to write notes on things that are functional, normal, and abnormal. Yep. <clears throat> and we're really pretty good at writing out, listing all the things that went wrong. But this is a good example of how we might list things that went properly, right? Yep. And things that were hmm, perhaps not mainstream swallowing in a normal setting, but uh, deserve some note in case things do change. It's mm -hmm. just a documentation that you might not treat. Absolutely. So if we're saying airway protection, would you say it's pretty normal? Yeah. Yeah, me too. 
What about bolus efficiency? I would say it's functional. I would say it's functional. I think the job is done. I think a healthy uh, younger person with no swallowing his problem history at all will probably get that cleanly down in one gulp. This yeah. is likely an older person based on the vertebra and the dentition. And sometimes older adults need a couple more swallows to clear the bolus, right? For, and for, uh, from the oral cavity, right? just they get that little bit of residue that's still left in the on the tongue and they mm -hmm. scoop it up and... Some of it falls back prematurely, but I wouldn't consider that abnormal. Mm -hmm. Now, let's look also at um, what we would say about airway, uh, sorry, about bolus efficiency. When we think about bolus efficiency, are we thinking about the tongue, the pharynx, the UES, and the swallow? Or the velum? So what stands out to me is the drainage in the back of the tongue mm -hmm. after the swallow. Again, the person feels it, even though it's there, and swallows as appropriate. This person appears to have, I know we can't confirm this, but appears to have good enough sensation that feeling the bolus drain from the ba mm -hmm. base of the tongue to the vollecula was sufficient to initiate a swallow that cleared that bolus. What mm -hmm. do you think? Yeah, something made them swallow again. That's right. And it was the right thing, whatever it was. Exactly. Now, would it surprise you if I told you this person has ALS? Um, it would. One, because we tend to think of ALS as being a little more severe, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't because I've seen a lot of patients that at early diagnosis that maybe even have a spinal onset that preserve their swallowing for a pretty long time, actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can't let the, the diagnosis bias you. Right, and your... so that's why I happen to know that this person had ALS, which is why I didn't say that, because if we go into this swallow saying, mm. uh, going to the study, and you can't get away from this as a clinician, right? You can't say, I'm gonna unlearn everything I did during the bedside swallow evaluation. You already know the person is ALS, but sometimes confirmation bias can be so strong that this very same swallow in somebody who is a community dwelling older adult who's, who's totally healthy versus a diagnosis of ALS would make you say, ooh, poor lingual control, <laughs> significant residue after the swallow, multiple swallows required to clear the bolus, recommend X diet change versus mm -hmm healthy community dwelling older adult, mm -hmm. some residue, but <clears throat> otherwise fine. So how, how would we document this differently depending on the diagnosis? Do you think this requires any notes that would be different if we're taking an objective approach? Yeah, I would comment, especially in, in degenerative diseases, commenting on what their baseline is at the moment is really important to be able to track disease progression. So I think that you comment on what you see in a very objective manner without adding a twist of severity too much because we can say that they swallowed two times to clear the bolus, but you don't have to say, oh, patient had required two trials to clear significant residue. Those are saying two very different things. So what you're saying is, <coughs> excuse me, we should not layer on excessive interpretation mm -hmm. when objectively we know it can be skewed in one or two different ways depending on our confirmation bias as a clinician. Yeah. What the report needs is a non-emotional representation of what actually happened. Mm -hmm. And then in your assessment, you can say patient has a history of XYZ, recommend this given the things you know about the patient. Mm -hmm. So you wanna give it some context in your assessment and recommendations. But when you're saying the objective information about what actually happened, just say what actually happened. Yeah. Don't, don't amp it up or dumb it down, if you will, depending on what you assume that same bolus flow meant. So seeing that bolus fall into the airway just there, don't make it seem like this was excessive versus minimal depending on what you think the patient was. It, it, it is what it is, right? Yeah. If this is minimal residue in your world, or if this is excessive residue, 
we shouldn't be changing it depending on the diagnosis, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I've read reports where it sounds like the swallow was terrible, but right. then when you see the swallow, it's like, that wasn't bad at all. Yeah, that wasn't so bad. But the report writer expected it to be bad. Right, exactly. So it's good to keep that in mind. Cool. Reminds me of radiologists that, um, you know, they work in a dark room all day and they don't have that emotional attachment to patients. They read an MRI, a CT scan, very unbiased. They see what they see, they report it, and then it's up to the physician that's handling the patient to interpret that radiographic information to the patient. It's not the radiologist's job. Mm -hmm. And as speech pathologists, it's difficult because we have to wear both hats. Yeah. So we have to be objective and unbiased when we're looking at fluoro and then almost take a step back and say, okay, now I'm the clinician. Now I'm going to use this information to apply it to this patient. You know, that's a good way to think about other fields that have to do what they do in a way. I I remember um, somebody who was a neurologist, had a lot of friends in radiology, said, my colleagues became radiologists because they don't want to deal with people. (laughs) (laughs) And I, you know, at first I thought they were were making a joke and it made it seem like it was a character flaw thing. But at the end of the day, um, it's the best way to be unbiased given the the diagnosis you're probably going to hand down. Like, you know, if you've seen the person in advance and you have all these feelings about what you're going to expect and you either do or you don't, that confirmation bias can be pretty strong. Yeah. Um, so if you're looking at forensic evidence, you're just looking at forensic evidence. Like, was it a fingerprint? Was it a match or wasn't it? That, you know, yeah. whether you thought the person was guilty or innocent is different from whether that is actually a match. Yeah. And so we need to think about that in our interpretation because sometimes we can under and unfortunately typically over interpret something that actually isn't there. Yeah. I've heard of some suggestion of models where in larger hospitals where there's more than one speech pathologist that one speech pathologist rotates in radiology and interprets interprets the video floras and writes the reports and sends them back to the speech pathologist taking care of the patient. Um, and then each speech pathologist kind of rotates through radiology to more create that um, that model. I've never seen it happen in practice, and I don't know if that's ever a way that a route that we would go. But I have heard people talk about that, of having somebody that's not emotionally connected to the patient. And we're speech pathologists; we are emotionally connected to our patients. There's no getting around that. There can be getting around that. I don't think every speech pathologist is emotionally collect- connected to their patient. Well, you can't remove the information that you've gathered before you walk into the radiology room. Well, that's true, but that might not be emotional. True. Um, but it's an interesting kind of segue to that. So, you know what? I think in other fields this does happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, in neuro- the neurologists who recommend the MRI, they don't go and run the MRI and write up the re- report and then report it to the patient. They hand that off to would be neuroradiologists or mm-hmm. whomever, and even sometimes it's the technician who actually runs the MRI yeah. and sends the images to the neuroradiologist. So it, there is this handoff process, and each person is an expert in what they do. Mm-hmm. Even if it's not possible to um, have a situation, the luxury of having all these steps where there's a professional who does the bedside, and then a floral expert, and a floral interpretation expert, et cetera, yeah. it does seem like there is room for co- collaboration and conversation at the very Absolutely. least, because y- you and I are sort of looking at the same floral and saying, oh, great, that, that's a great idea. AP would be a good idea here. Or yes, a, a, a water wash, a liquid wash is a good idea. And so I think it it gives you a better perspective if you're open to hearing what other people Mm -hmm. have to say. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's get another one out. What's behind door number three? Oh, boy. Interesting. Oh. So this is definitely somebody who's got some... Positioning issues. Yes, yes. Well, you can see the spinal hardware that likely is playing a factor. This is interesting to me because, boy, if you see this patient in the wheelchair coming towards you, confirmation bias has got to be out of control. (laughs) I know. It really comes back to that a lot. And you know, this person... 
you would think positionally would be more at risk because that because gravity is not in their favor with the bolus likely moving downward like yeah and what i didn't see any epiglottic inversion no so let's frame by frame this So the epiglottis is right here. And let's see if it ever inverts. It's still up there, uninverted. It does get a bit to horizontal, but the tip is still up. Yep. And then moves back to upright for breathing. I mean, and moving to horizontal is like well, it does very minimal us... amount. I mean, it doesn't take much and... So let's let's work on breaking this down a little bit. In terms of epiglottic inversion, we do know what that it's multifactorial. Mm -hmm. But if we first take a step back, we say, are there issues with airway protection? Now, there's some evidence that in a previous swallow, right, right, that there was likely some airway invasion, the extent to which is difficult to state to say here. But that definitely looks like it's below the vocal folds there. Right? So yeah. something happened before the swallow. Yeah. We're just jumping in in the middle. And there, you know, there is evidence of residue. Of course, I can imagine this is pretty difficult to get out because gravity is not on this person's side. There's basically something trapping. The yeah. epiglottis is literally trapping the bolus in here. Mm -hmm. um, and if you were super conservative, you would say, oh, if there's a buildup here, that would drain out and down. It's so easy for that to happen. But we mm -hmm. didn't see it in the swallow, right? Yeah. So um, we could say that there is... a some evidence that both bolus efficiency mm -hmm. and airway protection could be a factor, Yep. right? Um, and one obvious thing that we can point out is that there is not complete epiglottic inversion, Correct. right? So the question then is, why is there not epiglottic inversion? That's a good right? question. Um, so what do you think? Well, let's step back and talk about what makes the epiglottis invert. Okay. So we have elevation of the larynx. Mm -hmm. You have movement of the tongue posteriorly to help get the epiglottis to a horizontal position. Right, so the tongue is right adjacent to the mm -hmm. epiglottis. Mm -hmm. And then it's really the contribution of the pharynx that's going to help move the epiglottis from that horizontal position to its fully inverted position mm -hmm. by applying some compression to the epiglottis. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, let's take a look. So we can see the tongue has already moved it back some. So that's yeah. something, as well as the larynx moving. Mm -hmm. So we can see the tongue is moving back. It's moving the epiglottis back swell. It hasn't started yet, but there it goes, mm -hmm. right? The bolus plays a role as well yeah. in putting some weight on the epiglottis. However, we can never say the bolus is or is not responsible because yeah. in saliva swallows, healthy people get complete epiglottic inversion. Mm -hmm. It can be a factor to help, but it should never be the only factor, right? It's a tool in your toolbox. Exactly. Yeah. So if we go back, we can see the epiglottis does at least go toward the pharynx. So mm -hmm. it's moving back. The back part is hopefully the tongue's role. Yeah. So it did get back. But yeah. does it get down? So this is where pharyngeal constriction is supposed to help get this part of the epiglottis, the free end, I like to call it, yeah. to overlie the arytenoids. And we don't see that happening here. Yeah. One thing to note is that the bolus does, the epiglottis's role is to allow the bolus to go around it. You can see there's bolus likely in front and behind it. We can't tell for sure with fluoro because of depth perception is not possible. But um, I would surmise that if I did an AP view, we would see the bolus going on either side of the epiglottis there. Mm -hmm. And despite the fact that epiglottis didn't invert, this person did not penetrate or aspirate from what I could see. Did mm -hmm. you see it? It looked like there was a little was bit. There? Can I Let's go back? See. Yeah, sure. Whoops. I need to click on that. There we go. Okay, so... Sometimes it's hard to tell when there's already stuff in. If it's new or old, right? That's the so question. Does it look right there? Right here? Yep. Was that nope. already there? Oh. Right here. Let me move forward. Sometimes you got to go back and forth and back. No, that's a little too high. Yeah. Yep. And it's, I think that's already there. Yeah, I think so too. Oh, it's, right here? I can't point to the screen and have yeah, anyone see me. Yeah, that was definitely already there, and I'm yep. not sure that that's new material. So we can definitely see, well, we can definitely see 
um, right on the on the know, posterior is, aspect of the epiglottis. It kind of blurs with the the jawline. Yeah. Which yeah. yeah see here. Go. I'm gonna go back. Right. We watch it. right there. It just it's so important to just go back and forth and watch mm-hmm. these things. I've never seen anyone's airway go into their jawline quite this way. The positioning, this is a challenging one. The position yeah. does make it challenging. It does look like there's a tiny bit. Right in here. Yeah. yeah. And so, that does look like it could be new because we can see the retinoids right here mm-hmm. are up. Let's. Can we go back a little bit? Yeah. And let's just see if that's new material. So there's this that was already here, right? So you got the piriforms the piriforms blunting our view exactly. as well. <laughs> the piriforms are, could be dumping it into here. Yep. And then we can see, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then it looks like it moves. Yeah. So I would say there's definitely penetration, whether it's from the bolus from the oral cavity or bolus from the piriforms, we don't really know. Yeah. But we can see that um, if this person had to do sequential swallows, maybe we'd see more aspiration. We would see frank aspiration. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, there is evidence of um, airway protection issues in general. Yeah. So what would you tr- what would you test next? Let me go back. Goodness gracious. No. Oh. Okay. I really try to focus on if we can facilitate epiglottic inversion, and I might try an effortful swallow. This looks like a pretty large bolus. Mm-hmm. It is. Um, and I might I might do the same bolus again, but try it with an effortful swallow to try to see if we can um, encourage the epiglottis to invert. Mm-hmm. I don't know. What would you do? So... I would probably do the same thing, but I, I would probably go with a slightly heavier bolus. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, maybe, if this looks like a thin, I'd likely go with maybe a nectar. Um, even, I, I think a, a, a honey might gunk things up a bit. Mm-hmm. So even if I did a nectar honey mix to just get something, some weight on the epiglottis, advise the person to uh, swallow with more effort in hopes that they would be targeting their pharynx. It's always always a caveat with an effortful swallow. You don't know what they're squeezing hard, if anything. Um, and I, again, I, I really like the idea, of if this person positionally is not too challenging, for them to actually look at their swallow and mm-hmm. show them that there's stuff there. Yeah. I'd also wonder if they felt like anything went the wrong way. Yeah, that's true. I think it's important at this point to make a distinction um, about testing things in fluoro that you had mentioned using a nectar thick liquid. And I know that you're saying that because you're really focusing on manipulating the physiology to see mm-hmm. what the swallow is capable of. It does not mean that your goal is to put this person on nectar thick liquids. Oh God, no. no. So I think we have to get out of the mindset of, um, or distinguishing between diet and probing physiology. Mm-hmm. Um, I My rationale for doing sticking with a thin and trying a strategy would be, I wanna keep this person on the least restrictive diet possible. Mm-hmm. So I would try a strategy with the thin to see if that, to see how that looked, and then mm-hmm. try it with thicker consistencies to see how much of that makes a difference in probing the physiology. But still, look at this swallow, and let's say every swallow looked just like that with a large thin liquid mm-hmm. bolus. I didn't see anything here that would make me say, this person can't have thins. For That's sure. the issue. Mm-hmm. Um, this amount of penetration aspiration Assuming this person is has not been, you know, admitted for pneumonias on a very regular basis and has some significant underlying respiratory issues, mm-hmm. if this person doesn't have any of that, this, none of this is a reason. This this for person sure. doesn't look terribly different from some of the healthy volunteers I've had who are like eighty plus, yeah, who also have some of this positioning, mind you. Absolutely. Um, so even if. I test the larger ones. It's more so, as you said, to understand how it manipulates physiology. I'm rarely thinking, I just want it. My outcome measure, my outcome of this whole floral is diet recommendation. It's to probe the physiology. Mm -hmm. And by virtue of probing physiology, 
I can learn more about what diet I might recommend, absolutely. but that's never the primary goal. Yep, absolutely. Or nor is the goal to see if to confirm aspiration. Yeah, and one thing I would do in this case that I do with a lot of my patients is when I see airway invasion, I'll pause and I don't immediately tell them do you feel anything in your throat? I mm-hmm. wait a second to see if they're going to have a delayed cough or how they're going to manage it. And sometimes it just takes us to bite our tongue a little bit mm-hmm. to just wait and see how the patient responds. When it becomes clear to me that they don't have sensation, they're not going to spontaneously clear, I might ask them to clear to see if on command mm-hmm. they can clear their airway because mm-hmm. that can be a very beneficial strategy for somebody that is lacking sensation to say, hey, after every two to three swallows, Follows, I want you to just clear your throat for me. And right. that's something that they remember. They say a couple of drinks, <clears throat> clear their throat. And even if they don't sense it, that might be a protective aid mm-hmm. to help keep this patient on a least restrictive diet. Right. Absolutely. This is a good one. <laughs> nice. Oh, boy. You know what we didn't do? What didn't we do? Oh, my gosh. Look at that aspiration. Oh, okay, we didn't get yeah. freaked out. <laughs> it didn't even occur to me to do that. We're like, cool. <laughs> All right, let's check it out. Well, I would like to say I think there was a swallow. I think that little <laughs> bit of movement, let's just start there. Okay. Was there a swallow? Yes. Right? I think that. Do you think they have an airway protection issue? Let, let me look again, because I, God, I'm not sure. No, I'm just joking. There is an obvious if, airway protection If there's ever here. a question about where the vocal folds are, I know. that has been answered. Yeah, let us, let's just still shot and pause and have a two-second um, moment of silence for identifying <laughs> vocal folds right there. Um, Good Lord, right? Yeah. Talk about an outline. So... I think that this person's got some major airway protection issues. Mm-hmm. Um, and the question about airway protection to me is quite obvious. Um, this person certainly has issues with laryngeal vestibule closure. Um, so let's go down the list of all the possible, because, you know, events that are, could be an issue. Do we see lingual control issues? Well, here's my thought. In healthy people, with a thin liquid, I never see them pour it directly into the vollecula quite that much. Yeah. I mean, the tongue wasn't even trying to contain it in the yeah. oral cavity. So I'm going to say ding. You have yes. to try. You got to try. Cognitive, cognitive control to make yourself premature spill that, that much. much thin yeah, liquid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. So yes to the lingual control. Now, what about delay? Delay, yeah. So that was the attempt. Yeah, so let's distinguish that. So yeah. mm-hmm. it's important to understand when they attempted to swallow. That's right. So we're looking for that volitional posterior propulsion of the tongue. Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily. It might not be big and huge. It might yeah. be small, right? Mm-hmm. And sometimes you, I, I find you have to watch it in real time mm-hmm. to just get a sense of it. And then I go slow right And then I right go away. slow, yeah. So, so here's the thing that people have to remember is that the dividing line between what is known as poor lingual control, which leads to, can lead to premature spillage, versus a delay is volitional movement of the tongue mm-hmm. to initiate the swallow. If the bolus enters the airway, or not the airway, the pharynx at least, prior to the volitional movement of the tongue, then sure, that is one, some people might call it premature spillage, you can call it early release. The point is that it can be normal, it can be abnormal, it depends on the bolus type, yep. right? It happens all the time with... Cereal uh, is a good example. Cereal is a good example. We have studies with barium ice chips. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a study with thin liquid barium with um, chocolate chips. When you have mixed consistencies where you have drastically different consistencies, like something that needs to be chewed and something that's thin, people often let it drain to the back of their throat mm-hmm. um, while their oral cavity is busy chewing, and then they will swallow everything together. That is quite normal in healthy people. Yeah. It is rare for that to happen with thin liquids in healthy people, yeah. where they just let it drain back there all willy-nilly, right? Yeah. And then, let's see where the, where the official swallow attempt was. To me, that was it, Yeah. right? So when you're, and I ask myself this all the time when I see a swallow, especially in real time, that I'll ask, okay, was that premature spillage or was that 
a delayed swallow. And the first question I have to ask myself is, when and where was volitional lingual propulsion? Right. That will help me distinguish between the two. Right, because a delay means that the trigger didn't happen even though an attempt for the trigger to happen was made. Yep. And the attempt is our volitional posterior lingual propulsion. Some people call that tongue-based retraction. Same thing, mm -hmm. different term. But when you try to swallow, you push the bolus back there volitionally, and there is a significant delay, nothing happens, then we're on the delay end because we're on the other side of that volitional initiation mm -hmm. attempt. So um, if that was the point where he had tried to initiate, boom, right there. You can see the larynx is moving up, the UES opened. I think the swallow itself, while it was not very functional at all, it was dysfunctional, the initiation appeared to be timely, but the swallow itself was just not doing it. Yeah. What do you think? I agree. And let's talk for a minute about how we define, so we've take, let's move away from Premature spillage, and let's talk about how we define a delayed swallow. Mm -hmm. So, what are we looking for? Is it the head of the bolus, where the where the head of the bolus is when hyoid burst occurs, or are you looking at the difference between when the bolus head passes the ramus of the mandible when hyoid burst occurs? So, those are different. So, mm -hmm. clinically, what most people do is they say where the bolus was when initiation occurred. Bolus at volecula at swallow initiation, bolus at piriform. And they try to make a judgment based on those. Those are certainly clinically relevant ways to measure it, and it gives the, the reader of the document some a way to think about what they saw, right? I don't have a problem with that. We're taking into consideration that this person didn't actually attempt to swallow until a little bit later on. Right, that this person did allow the bolus to enter the pharynx long before they actually volitionally attempted to start the swallow. And in this case, the bolus that they did that with is not a bolus that healthy people typically do that with. Mm -hmm. So that was a significant factor in the bolus then being adjacent to the airway, a larger thin bolus being adjacent to the airway when the swallow did start. The swallow that was not very efficient at all because you could see that let's say let's say the bolus wasn't already down here, right? Oh, I need to go back. I can't even tell when the swallow is. <laughs> Let me do it slow. There we go. So the bolus is dumping into the airway because it is wide open. Yeah. While they're initiating their swallow, that is the most amount of closure that they get. But once they decided to initiate the swallow, the mm -hmm. swallow was initiated very promptly. Oh, the, yeah, there was not a delay issue. Absolutely. But then the quality of the swallow in terms of maximum closure was not, was not, was not effective in terms of airway closure. Also, UES opening, if we go back, mm -hmm. we look at UES opening, it so, was minimal. So I would say the lingual control. So there we go. The amount of UES opening is virtually yeah. nothing. So of course, there was all this bolus to dump here. Yeah. What were you saying about lingual control? I was control? gonna say the lingual control and the premature spillage um, is a factor, but this isn't a delayed swallow. No, no. It's a factor, but honestly, um, it's the bigger factor is the swallow that did start was not great. But you know, and look the at pharyngeal the, squeeze is not so horrible. Look but, at that. Right, but look at a retinoid movement to the base of the epiglottis. What a retinoid movement exactly. to the base of the epiglottis. Exactly. So the, here Wide are their open. retinoids here, and they're usually touching the base of epiglottis. Mm -hmm. Here, I'll go back. So we have the retinoids are way over here and the base of the epiglottis are way over here. All of this space needs to be covered to keep a bolus from entering. And as we scroll forward, you can see that bolus is nicely outlined there are retinoids. Yep. The base of the epiglottis is here. And still, there's all of that room and there's more bolus in that space than in anything else. This is why I just wanna point out when people talk about the vocal folds being a factor, <laughs> in airway protection during the swallow, what good are the vocal folds if there is a ton of bolus on them? This is the importance, laryngeal vestibule closure is the first line of defense in airway mm -hmm. protection. Sure, it's nice in those people who have decent laryngeal vestibule closure who eventually from bottom to top can squeeze out the bolus or can cough at this point because they're really able to get good control of their 
vocal folds of their larynx and just cough that bit out before it gets in. We've seen that quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, um, if there's if it's flooded, what what good is it going to be? Exactly. Thank you.